Hello and welcome. I'm Centropedes and today we're going to be continuing with our Road Warden stream. Um, I apologize for not being on camera for a while, but uh, I thought that we've committed to this with this game. Um, so we're going to continue with it, but I'm hoping if I have some spare time this week um, that the next session we'll be doing will be camera on, probably moving back to War Tales. Um, but I was feeling this vibe. Also, I only have about an hour and a half today, so um, this game seemed to fit quite nicely. So, from what I can recall, um, we have been moving around. Obviously, I'm not sure I can look at the map right now, um, but we're speaking to this old man who's guarding this kind of mine. Um, he is basically done with us now, uh, so we've done some like stuff for him. I think we gained something in the inventory. Um, what did he give us? Um, food rations. I thought we gathered something, but maybe we gave it to him. Um, fish trap locations we've already set up. We need to actually go back and check on that at some point. Um, yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to travel um, to a new location. So we are um, here. So we need to start moving. Um, I wonder if we could do the ruins and pick up the guy and take him to somewhere because to be honest this is blocked so is this so is this so we basically have to go this way instead until we can find some kind of alchemic um ingredient or something that will allow us to um sort get past those kind of gnat creatures um because obviously basically we're blocked from from looking at going that way um until we can find something that's this up here um, the gate, we don't want to go in the heart of the forest. We've been warned against that, so that's that's not a good idea. Um, let's have a look and see. So can we see in the journal um, the scavenger? He needs another day. That was on day one. I think a day has passed, but I'm not 100% sure. How do we tell that? Um, journal? I don't actually know. Maybe in the archive? Hmm. It should be a bit easier, you'd think, wouldn't you? Maybe uh, Maybe we just have to go and see. Um, maybe it tells us in here. Also, we really need to wash. Like, I'm pretty sure we're absolutely vile and disgusting right now, so we should probably try and do something about that. Um, but it's easier said than done. We need to buy some soap and we have no money. Um, which is not great. Ooh, sewing experience. That's cool. Um, brilliant. So, let's have a little gander. We're going to go over... You know what? We're here. Let's go to the ruins and see if what's his name will let, will let us uh, transport him somewhere. Um, hmm. Oh, we can check our fish trap. Unfortunately, it's still empty. Um, uh, we don't have any soap, so I don't think we can wash ourselves. We've got three coins. That's basically sod all, though. Um, okay, let's go back to the scavenger. Brought you some food. Gather your bags and take you to Howler's Dell. Well, the thing is, we kind of want to go to the Pelt of the North, really. Um, so I reckon we set, we bring him there. Um, he keeps asking you to watch out for beasts and, and wraps the sharper scraps of iron in his cape. Folding the tent and putting it on your horse takes a while, and neither of you can sit down on the large pile of sacks and bundles. There's a long walk ahead of you, but for Sadal it won't be much of a burden. Once you clear the room, you walk away. At first you hear only the birds and horseshoes, then the man starts to whisper. Faster, eh? The apes are looking at us. You don't see any proof of that. Nothing we can do about it. I lead us to the southern gate. Hmm. Is there going to be some kind of combat or something? I haven't... Yeah, I haven't actually done any combat in this game yet, so I don't know how it works. You move forward, slow down by having to secure the bundles on Sadal's back and carry your bags. After half an hour, the man asks for a break. He's weakened by days of hunger, but the farther away you get from the ruins, the more cheerful and talkative he gets. Mostly speaking about what he needs to buy and how much he hated that debt, please. Then the beasts show up. Prepare your axe. Okay. Combat. What is this going to entail? That's the question. Hmm. I do wonder. 
A loud bunch of griffins block the road near a pond. For you, their colourful furs and feathers don't look much different than the pack you faced in the valley days ago. There's still some distance between you and them, but it could be crossed in less than a minute. Maybe there's 20 beasts in sight, and this time they pay you much more attention. They spread their wings and start to screech, some making a few leaps forward. Your mount is too overloaded for you to turn away and get out of their range. Better hold our ground, groans the scavenger, preparing his crossbow and dagger. Jesus Christ, there's two of us versus 20 of them. Okay, two is stupid. There's 20 of them. True, let's stay on the defensive, but keep an eye on the horse. This is tricky because I don't um, know a lot about griffins. Um, we do have, technically, we have information about beasts. So let's have a look. Griffins. The scrub griffins are four legged omnivores larger than fox that merge creatures, um, features of furry critters, and birds. Their front parts are covered with feathers, wings seem massive, making them impressive jumpers, but they're too heavy to fly. There's still more to learn about them. Yeah, we don't know enough, unfortunately, to, to know anything about weaknesses or anything like that, which is unfortunate. Um, so because I'm thinking this one, but maybe this will just enrage them and then they'll just attack us. Um, I don't actually know. This could be bad. Um, yeah, two is so dumb. Um... Also, I really don't want to lose the horse. Okay, let's play defensive, because we don't know how the beasts are going to react. He nods and blocks the path between the beasts on your mount, then raises his loaded weapon, moving his aim between the approaching creatures. I don't have a potion, don't have a crossbow. Okay, I stay close to scavenger, making sure nothing jumps on our backs. I keep a bit of distance between us, so we have enough space to fight. The thing is, we're not really... He's got a crossbow, and I'm not a big fighter, so I feel like the first one's probably the best choice. The man's arrow hits and stops one of the creatures, but it doesn't buy you much time. He realises your plan and also gets closer to you. The semicircle of beaks and talons is hardly organised. One of the creatures simply leaps at you and the others follow. For the next minute, you slice and dice whatever you can hit, filling the air with screeches and feathers. The sheer number of opponents overwhelms you more than once, and it's difficult to keep pushing them away with your free hand, judging by the painful shouts... The scavenger is struggling, but still alive. Finally it ends, though not because of lack of opponents. Two creatures you butchered are on the ground, but the others, some of them hurt, have enough strength to run away. Their will is broken, and the pack will go on, at least for some time. Your firing Emerson keeps you in one piece, and it's still in decent shape. The man spits on the ground. May apes and ibexes bang this place day after day! He leans forward, taking a few deep breaths and looks at you. Roadster! What a fine team, ye and I! Let me draw my ballista, and we can move forward. I don't, just always end up reverting to Scottish with these people. I'm not really sure why. <laughs> I need to really mix up the accents. Um, I was kind of, I had like a good guttural English with him at the start, and then I kind of lost it. Um, I just smile and try to ease Sadal's thoughts. It's better to keep moving. Real well. You know what? That went bizarrely well. I feel like we should have got something from that, like... Should we not have got some, like, griffin pieces or something? That feels pretty cheap. Not gonna lie. But never mind. We can survive without that. Um, also, if anybody does want to contribute on, like, decision-making, I'm absolutely fine to hear people's contributions. Um, so feel free to, like, let me know what you think. Obviously, if you're just kind of listening in and, and chilling out, that's also fine. Uh, the man's sleeve and stomach are soaked with blood, but he tells you to ignore it. Once you get close to Pelt, he whistles enthusiastically. You weren't kidding. What a fortress. The guards open the gate and take care of the scavenger's bundles, which Sadal welcomes with a nicker. The man introduces himself quickly and asks to be brought some, some water for the well. Thank ye, Roadster. I need to ask the innkeep if he has any soap. I'm not going to chop off my damn arm. But like I told you, if you want coins, you have to come back tomorrow, when my pouch gets heavier. Well, can and would prefer to give ye the potion that repels ape men instead. It's useful, but not as much in the south as it is here, in the woods. 
I'll be here tomorrow or later. Don't leave before you pay me. Five dragon bones. Um. Okay, I, I don't... I just want the money. I don't want the jar. So let's just do that. Um. So we need to pop back to him. Don't worry. If, if anything, I can always lead him to the innkeep. I'll be here for at least a couple of days. You'll find me around. After all my recent camp camping... I'm going to spend a few hours kissing the nice strong wall. Brilliant. Um, okay. I don't think we actually need to do anything here. Should we go to the innkeeper, though? Because we technically have spoken to... Um, what's his name? We don't re really need food. Um, we definitely need to wash. Like, if he has some soap, we really could... Could do that. Oh wow, it worked. People say she's a good mayor, but she's oh uh, this is the posh guy. People say she's a good mayor, but she's rich from birth, so also careless. She doesn't know the struggle, the hunger and dirt, so fancies her clothes more than one should. She thinks she keeps her village safe, even though it's the druids who do all the work. He looks down, but finally speaks again. She may be frivolous, but she isn't stupid. If you're smart, better keep your eyes open. Okay, I don't think we have anyone else um, that we need to know about. We could gamble and see if he'll feed us. Um, show me a wares. Ooh, okay, so... We actually do need to do something. So we were going to get some quarrels to give to... Um, to... The guy. Where is he? Eastern Path. Um, hmm, I'm leaning back a bit, so I hope you can hear me. Um... I actually technically have ocean. Um, I'm sure there was somebody we found, we bumped into, who needed some quarrels, but I I can't remember um, if if that it's not been entered into the journal, so maybe maybe not. He doesn't want anything of ours. Um, Let's just ask. Not today, maybe tomorrow. Okay. What do you expect me to do with him once he's here? He can handle some easy tasks, asking him to be on the lookout for beasts and travellers. He's a brave, strong soul. He could assist your hunters on their trips. Um. Yeah, maybe this. We use our wits and traps, not so much brute force. But I guess you're right. A fierce fighter may be of use. He rubs his arm and reaches for a piece of roasted lizard. Bring him here. I offer him gruel and a corner to sleep, and I'll pay him once he catch helps us catch some worthy game. Okay, that's all I need. Um, we could try and quiz him a bit now, like while we're here. Um, we obviously are going to have to come back to him at a later date, so it's probably not going to be. But let's ask him about his travels. You must understand, you're a roadster. People ask you for help. They don't think you'll steal from them when you're in bed. It's not the same when you're a drifter. They don't ask me to stay to marry their kids or to help them with harvest. They just ask if I plan to pay for the room or buy stuff. You talk for some time, though it's quite difficult to uncover the details hidden in his tail. He claims he and a packbird came here by boat, about which he refuses to speak. He landed just next to Gale Rocks, a large fishing village near the southern shore. People there were irritable and unwilling to idly chat with him, but opened their mouths after he helped them at the smokehouse. On sunny days, the locals hunt on the shore, and when it gets dark, they hide behind the walls, gutting fish. And when the weather goes to shit, they boil water for salt and put fish in it, and hop to their barrels, but I don't know how. They don't have many trees around. Then they sell the meat to the villages and, you know, places for crops. 
I was told to stay away from the White Marshes, though no shell told me why. I joined a group of fish traders who were going to Old Pagos and its monastery. All hate that place. Ah, everyone does. I traded there for a bit, but the villagers are cold. They spend days praying and talking on and on about their duty. And a grey like an ashworm. So I left once at dawn. Me and my bird. And wasn't that a mistake? He was attacked by a short bear-like creature. He tried to run away, but following the bear, his bird was a bad idea. He fell over in the thicket, so the monster had time to get to him. I hit it with a bolt. It wasn't enough. I kicked it, so it bites my legs and tears my flesh away. I almost dozed off from the pain, can you believe it? That lazy bird came back and charged at it with its beak. His dagger was enough to get through the surprised animal's belly, and it ran away. How did he survive with such deep wounds? The bird was patient and let me lean on it. My ballista scared Griffs away and we got to Howler's Dell. That's where I found the elders. They agreed to heal me, but only for coin, and told me it's an exception. After three questions, you assure the elders he means the local druids, held by the villagers in great esteem. They didn't want to talk with me a whole lot. Instead, I'm impudent. You hear that? I spend time with Face, at least. She wasn't so boring. You ask him about her and he's more than happy to answer. She's the mayor, so to speak. Once you get there, she'll make sure to see you. You'll know it's her. She's short and her blonde hair is straight and long. She wears dresses and rouges just tricks like a merchant. She's not scary. Uh, not scary at all, at least, as long as you don't ask her about her wealth. Tell her a joke or two, or drink some mead, or play dice. Her laugh is someone else. Why did you leave Howlers down alone? It wasn't smart to move to the ruins all by yourself. Ah, oh, it's my trade. I shouldn't tell you, and I won't. You already know all you need to know. Um. Okay. Uh. Yeah, let's bugger off. So... Okay, I managed to wash a tiny, tiny bit um, with just water, um, but that's fine. So, we're going to head in the other direction now, then. It'll be too late to explore an unfamiliar area. Oh, okay, it's too late in the day. Um, so, we're going to have to sleep. So, what does this do? We lose... It's only one, actually, to, to sleep in a room, um, which we probably should do. So let's do that. It's only one. That's pretty cheap. But yeah, money is going to be a serious problem. You hear a thunderous roar. You rise to your feet and rub the sleep from your eyes. The doors are opening. People are shouting orders and words of warning. As you open the window, you see what's behind the commotion. Something is on the other side of the wall trying to get through, and the guards are fighting it off with their torches, spears, and crossbows. Thanks to their light, you see the large furry paws placed on top of the wall walk. Oh, excuse me. As far as you can tell, the beast is but a single leap away from getting inside. I might as well help them, like they might give me some money or something. You look for your gambeson and blade, still a bit foggy in your thoughts, and once you find them, you struggle to get inside your jacket. As your habits kick in, you see the innkeeper right in front of you holding a candle. You're a guest. Stay here. My team has no time to worry about outsiders. Just before his words, you hear cheerful laughter from the wall. Judging by the way they point their fingers and lower their weapons, the beast is fleeing. Hmm, if I'd been there, maybe we could have caught it. Interesting. The small room is quiet and far away from unwanted eyes. You take a calm bath, rest on a soft mattress, and look through the window, enjoying minutes of safety. In the morning, you'll find a stool with a large wooden plate bearing an aromatic breakfast. Two boiled eggs, a cup of buttermilk, and some ibex offals. Downstairs, the innkeeper is putting firewood into the stove. He asks if you need anything. Nice. So, we've got full vitality. We're nourished. Yeah, Gamerson's very good. Okay, cool. Um... Okay. I met Quintus, the one they trained with your team. He may need your help. He explained the difficult situation he finds himself in, putting emphasis on his wounds and food issues. Listening to your conversation, the nearby guards surround you, forming a circle together with the boar, and ask if Quintus is in one piece. Your tale causes tension to give way to jokes. He is too scared of the wrath of the herbs that he'll sooner eat his bloody crossbow than learn how to use it, says an older woman. Let's give the poor guy a break. 
the guard in yellow armor interrupts, which is not welcomed by a one-eyed man who comments, He's not even here! After another minute, she grins at you. Thanks for telling us. We'll change some plans and get in touch with him on our next trip. Come on, not that! Same man chips in, but quines down to the redhead stare. Hmm. Oh, are you asking me out? I uh, ain't interested in any silliness. She brushes away the hair from her forehead. The tangled chaos all over her scalp cares not for her efforts. I'm Dalit. Half my life ago, I was living on crops, but I bet I've shut down more monsters than you've broken eggs. Are you much of a fighter? Many more eyes turn towards you. If you live as a traveler, you face enemies. Not really an option. While Dalit pats the boar, the guards get back to their own affairs. I guess, but there's always an option to stop the journey. One should look for a new home. I'm looking for knowledge about wild creatures. Well, I told you our knowledge is valuable, I don't know. Fifteen dragons, no less? Jesus Christ. Oh, well, depending on the friend. Let's say thirteen. If it's too much for you, maybe ask me after you spend some time around. Show us what you're capable of. Or play dice with us when you have an hour to spare. These folks here, they crave gossip. Okay, um, I have a job for your crew. As long as it involves someone paying for it, I'm ready to listen. What do you know about the pack? Without interruptions, you tell as much as you can. Getting rid of them will do the trick, sure, but as long as those buildings ain't raised to the ground, new beasts will move in sooner or later. Though I ain't one to stop you from reaching into your pouch. Now you need to take care of some things first. Hunters or not, we won't raid a lair blindly. What do you want me to do? Um... She lists your tasks one by one, in the meantime, bending forward to brush the boar. Make sure you've looked around the entire village. My crew will get mad if it turns out the, the yet another lair is just behind the corner. Then be sure there's no soul around. When we fight, we don't do rescue jobs, and if we do, they cost a lot. The boar grunts and turns around, leading, leading her to its other side. Speaking of which, for you it's going to be 12 coins, but we'll take some of the loot we find. We won't let any go of magic swords and rings just because... Not that I expect any, but who knows? <laughs> we won't take you with us, Centripedes. You can kill a goblin good, but we have a team. Our own words. Knowledge of our strong and weak sides. We don't need you around. Just give us two or three days after you pay us and we'll take care of it. Oh, cool. So we can sort out those goblins somehow. Um, okay, we could try dice again. We, we did win money last time, but we really don't have money to lose. We only have two money. Um, okay. Surely, but we're doing it the right way. All ten rounds, so it's going to take us half an hour or so. Four players, each one bets a coin, and the winner takes it all. Still in? I think we should come back and do this another time. We really do need money, though. If we lose, I'll be too annoyed, so I'm going to just leave it. Um... Let's go and, and explore. The curvy road east is overgrown. Sadal trots when it has a chance, but more often it walks. Forced to jump over larger branches blocking the path. The nearby lake is surrounded by thirsty wildlife. I observe the dark forest, ready to react if something jumps at me. Ooh. A couple of stone slabs were turned into a hut-like shape, one of the ancient chapels raised by the priests of the United Church in the days of a few soldiers and even fewer shelters. The dolmens proved to be especially durable, though the conditions they offered were harsh. The entrance is barely wide enough to let you walk inside. It was meant to guard, uh, keep larger beasts away, including your palfrey. You can't spend the night here. You dismount and look around. It's the most common religious sign of the city folk. Adapted by the United Church, Orders of Truth, and the majority of fellowships. It's used in temples and during funeral rites, but also uh, to decorate codices or jewellery. The winged hourglasses portray the ephemera ephemerality. That is a word I've never come across before. Ephemerality. Well, ephemeral is like... I don't, I don't really know how to define it. You know what, let's look it up. Lasting for a short time, yeah, I was thinking transient, but I suppose that's not quite accurate, really. Interesting. Um, 
When possible, they're made of steel, signifying the strength of humankind's determination and innovation. As a member of the Order of Truth, I should bow before the hourglass to honor the brave builders of the past. You stay in front of the symbol, lowering your head um, and gathering your thoughts. You try to imagine the struggles of the valiant builders who put their time, sweat and tears um, and blood into gathering, shaping and transporting these huge rocks. They were led by a vision, one that requires artistry, planning, the sense of shared purpose. They did it for the sake of the future generations, and even if their names are forgotten, they saved many lives. The orders teach to be thankful for such sacrifices. In your silent prayer, nature seems both distant and complementary. It doesn't shape itself around your thoughts, but you feel like nothing is going to hurt you. Not while you're here. For a while, you balance between chaos and order. So be it. You say at the end of your prayer, as the tradition has taught you, the birds are singing delightfully. After my prayer, I step away. Sadal is playing, playfully poking the nearby bushes, ready for a further journey. I enter the the, um, the chapel. The beams of light uh, get through the gaps between the rocks, but you can hardly see anything. A torch would fill the place with smoke, but a candle will suffice. You wonder how many travellers have sat in the cold rock observing the entrance and fighting with their heavy eyelids. I look around. Um, yeah, I don't know. Let's, let's look at the door. Wall? Uh, rock. Even though part of the ground is covered with a single massive slab, there are parts free of any flooring. You see soil, small rocks, and sand. In one, you spot the remains of charred wood. Charred wood. Part of the floor is littered with the remains of an old campfire, not more than a couple of months old. You see dust, burnt bones, and wood. The wall above this spot is covered with soot. Um... Let's have a look at the bones. Part of the floor is lit with the remains of an... Oh, it's just the same thing. Um, what else? I kind of want to see if there's anything left in here, but, like, um, I'm not sure what what that would be. Um, food? I don't know. Um, clothing? No, okay, never mind. I don't think there's anything in there. If there is, we don't know what it is. Cool, let's travel. Um, so we're going to head over this way because that's the only direction we can go in right now. The neglected path barely finds any space among the hills. Trees and streams. There's a deer on the ground lying in a red puddle surrounded by a small pack of creatures which notice your presence quickly. There's about eight of them, with thick furs in shades of brown, grey, and black, and hairless faces with small eyes and long mouths. Currently stained by the blood of their prey, some of them move on all fours, while others comfortably stand on two feet. There are two to three heads, shorter than you, but it's your mount which truly towers above them, and you see how a couple of the beasts take a few steps back, grunting and glancing at each other. The one with grey fur shouts, and the others move towards the rocks and sticks which are piled on the ground. What kind of creatures are they? Hmm. Large mouths stained with blood. What the hell? Are they like... Kind of like humans? Interesting. I don't know. I don't know what these things are. Um, they hold them awkwardly, and some struggle to maintain a straight posture leaning on their new weapons for support. Then almost all of them spread to your left and right, blending with the shrubs loudly. Only two of the apes are left standing still, so these are the apes. This is not bad. Oh, they're goblins. Um... Okay. Let's have a quick look. Um... In the journal. Goblins? Furry critters can move on two legs and all fours. While they resemble apes, they spend most of their time on the ground, capable of hunting for their prey seeking new temporal shelters. Many people, both in the monasteries of the Order of Truth and at marketplaces, argue how smart a goblin can really get. It's clear they can fight with a pointed stick or pick up an abandoned sword, but it looks like they can't start their own fire nor speak. Nevertheless, some people call their lairs camps. Okay. Yeah, so these are definitely goblins, um, which is not a good sign. Um, the only thing is, if we don't go th in this direction, we actually have nowhere else we can go. If we leave here, that's basically it. Because we this is blocked. 
we we don't want to go in the heart of the forest. Everybody's telling us not to do that. Um, we have no other solution, really. Um, unfortunately, so we kind of have to keep have to like try, because if we don't, we just got nothing else to do. Um, interesting. I'm not sure. Yeah, let's just go. I grab my axe and hold the reins tightly. We'll probably just die. So Dale tries to turn around, but loyally follows your directions. So we can charge at the goblins, scream at the pack, shaking my weapon, trying to scare them. Throw some food. Okay. Um, we can probably beat some of them up and make them run away, but like, there's a lot more of them and they seem to be clever. We could try to scare them. They seemed pretty scared um, at the start. I feel like the two at the top are the best options. If we do anything else, it seems kind of weak. But... I don't know. We could just charge at the goblins in the middle of the road. They're pretty scared of the palfrey. Let's try that. Your mount speeds up, though it doesn't have enough space to enter a gallop. You prepare your weapon, but while you feel somewhat uncomfortable with a blade on foot, fighting from a saddle is completely unfamiliar to you. The younger goblin attempts to stop your horse, but the strike it receives sends it in a nearby bush screaming in pain. The grey one, however, managed to just grab your boot and is now trying to keep up with your speed, making one long leap after another. The first strong swing of your axe wasn't able to reach the target. A spear would do better in this scenario. Kick it off? I think that's probably the best thing, right? You swing your foot around, or at least try to, overwhelmed by the weight and the muscles of the beast. You finally find the right moment when the goblin lands on its paws. The precise hit between the eyes makes it roll over to the road, and your mount runs faster. Your leg is free, and the road is clear. For a few more moments, you hear the angry shouts and screeches, but soon after that, it's again only you and your mount. Okay, wow, that was cracking, like, pretty pleased with that. Um, but yeah, we're probably going to encounter them again on the way here. A round pine tree, oh, for God's sake, a round pine tree blocks the road. For a wayfarer, walking over the thin branches at the top is not much of an issue. Even Sadal, led on, led on a rope, could walk around the stump, but a larger wagon couldn't move onward in one piece, at least not without detaching the mules and packing all the wares and moving everything by hand. Cutting a tree into pieces would take hours, even with proper tools, and you can't hope to move it with just the muscles that you and your mount have to offer. Um, I consider washing myself. We need soap. I want to look around. Okay, the surrounding area. You walk deep into the wilderness, searching around the shrubs and trees. You don't find any side paths nor remains of a camp. The first game trail you find has been has been used exclusively by animals. The tree. The leaves are not completely dry, and when you break one of the twigs, it still contains water. There are no signs of sickness, but you can recognise, and the termites and other bugs are still sparse. Beneath the trunk, there's no blood and no abandoned limbs. Hmm, the stump. You don't find any marks of more paws. The, tip, the top is hip-high and unnaturally smooth. You couldn't comfortably sit down on it. That's really strange. The tracks. In the trampled grass, you find two sets of tracks to follow. There are no hoof prints. The first set is near the destroyed wagon. The wayfarer suddenly stopped. You can see why they made a sharp turn. The second trail is close to the street tree stump. Most of the marks were left by flat, cheap boots, not suitable for long walks, but someone was wearing hard, wide heels, distorting the ground. Both trails avoid the eastern wilderness. They stick to the main road and lead you north. They could have belonged to two dozen people, maybe more. You follow them for a bit, but lose them once there's no more mud and tree needles to find. Hmm... It seems like an ambush, right? The wagon. The planks are still firm and there's no mustiness in the air, but the vehicle needs just a push to fall to pieces, like a child's toy with nothing to keep the parts together. There are ways to construct a wagon with just wood, leather and fibre, but you find the marks of hinges, braces, nails and clamps, which are now all gone. The wheels are missing their steel rims. You find only one linen bag, empty and moist. You can't estimate how deep the tracks are, 
the ground was hard, so the cart's weight wasn't a significant factor. So they've obviously ambushed these people. Um, we haven't got any um, any blood yet signs yet, but it seems like their cart was basically taken apart um, by whatever happened. Um, the river would only take two steps to disappear into the deep water. The rocky bank smells fresh and is filled with the sounds of frogs, insects, and birds. It's not a good spot to quench your thirst. The beds of long kelp pulled by the flow of the river are crowded with fish and four-legged creatures that you don't even recognise. You keep an eye on the land. There's no carcass in sight and no sign of shells that will be left nearby. Okay, the bushes. You find an arrow. There are no berries left, only broken twigs, fallen leaves and trampled grass. You notice a pointy arrow made by a human hand. With a head made of horn and black orange fletching. These feathers originally belonged to one of the local pheasants. You see no arrow marks around, not even a wagon. So obviously one of the, the local people have, have ambushed whoever the, the travellers were. Hmm, the western hill. The rocky wall isn't much of a challenge. The top of the hill is covered with short grass and sparse trees. You notice a couple of bushes with a good view of the road. Just next to the remains of a campfire, charred pieces of wood, ash, bird bones, trampled grass and a broken earthenware pot. You follow the deepest tracks leading to the edge of the soft earth. Someone jumped down, or at least stopped stepping on the grass. Okay, um, I think I know what happened here. Let's take another look. Tree stump, what have we done? Uh, I think we've looked at everything. The road. The road here is already being overgrown, faded away, but it's in no worse shape than other parts of the southeastern route. No alternate path has been formed around the blockade. So it's, it's fairly recent, but not that recent. Okay, I think I know what happened here. It was cut down to set up an ambush. Why was the wagon ab um, abandoned? Um, this is hard. It was attacked by monsters. I don't think that's true. It was likely attacked by highwaymen. What was originally transported in the wagon? We can't tell that. What happened to the owners of the wagon? Um... They were taken north. You think the tree was cut down, set up an ambush. The cart was transported, unknown contents was attacked by high women, and its owners were taken north. Are you sure this is most likely what happened? I don't know, I'm sure. While you can't be sure of really what happened here, you don't think there's much left for you to find. Let's hope you haven't missed anything. Okay. Is this it? Oh my god. Are we stuck again? Oh no, we can move. Cool. Brilliant. Oof, I was worried there that we were going to have, like, a block. And we wouldn't be able to move move into the next part. Which would have been really annoying. Cool. Um, as long as you ride uphill, the forest is sparse. Soon after, the tree roots tear the path apart. The road is coated with branches, acorns, leaves and chestnuts, and some seedlings have already broken through the pitted surface of the road. If left undisturbed for another year or two, the forest will reclaim this place. Finally, you ride upward again. The plants are getting smaller, the road more rocky. I sigh with relief. Ooh, cool. While the hills are full of life, you don't hear anything coming from the watchtower. Its upper level lacks a wooden platform from which the guards could fire their crossbows or drop stones on the opponents below. So this place was not meant to be used in combat, but rather as a shelter from claws and fangs. Such structures can be found in especially untamed parts of the Dragonwoods, used occasionally by travellers or patrolling squads. Since the end of the war, the cities can't find enough people to keep dragon bones, uh, dragon bones keep them in good shape. You see no footsteps, no lights, no fresh trash or a latrine. The birds are preening their feathers on top of the tower, while the branches of nearby trees are swaying with a fierce cold wind. Um, let's have a gander. I look for the tracks I saw near the fallen tree. 
The tracks lead here, though through the narrow gate, then west. The hard heels are especially noticeable. I approach the entrance. I look at the signpost. The wooden letters are damaged by decades of rain, frost, borers, claws, and mosses. You scratch off some of the moss. Planks on the top points both towards the watchtower, where the letters spell south and away from it, with the additionally carved north. The one beneath it points east, and this time you see a tidily written word painted on the wood in blue. Enchanting. In Hovlaban, enchanters are artists specialised in filling ordinary items with magical pneuma, and sure enough, the arrow here looks like a magic wand. The bottom plank pointing west has a picture of a tall tower on it, surrounded by a little house. The carving spells monastery, but the wood is covered in red paint, suggesting danger. Okay. Maybe there's something interesting along the spruce trees. It must be a human-made copse. Only the smallest of the spruces are out of order, born of wild seeds. The largest trees are as tall as the tower itself, which surely doesn't help those who are meant to observe their surroundings. There are some stumps, mostly, most of which used to belong to young saplings. These trees uh, were likely meant to be sold to carpenters and coopers, but they weren't left alone many years ago. In the copse, you find wild fennel and lettuce thriving in shadows, and there are pears and berries growing among nearby trees and shrubs. Um, okay, we've looked at the signpost, gate, examine the campfire spot of the fence. You see a shattered bowl, the remains of a meal from many years ago. However, the firewood and the lonely stool are not too old. You don't doubt that the watchtower seems less threatening to wayfarers than the wilderness around it. I walk to the gate. Setting up a firm wall in place like this is a bit unusual. It goes on for no more than 40 feet until it connects with a natural rock face. Such a structure could be found in the city, acting as a checkpoint at which to stop travellers to search through their belongings or request a fee. But in the middle of nowhere? Deer and other animals used to be running here with no hindrance. Must have been more than more than annoyed. Annoyed. A risky investment. You touch the gate made of high quality wood, previously soaked in oil, now mostly wiped off. It was left open and you don't see any wooden bar that would be used to lock it. You try to move the cold planks buried in dried out mud, but with no luck. It would require some wearying digging. Okay. Um I approach the entrance. You take a look at Sadal. If necessary, it could bow its head and walk inside. The place should be a decent shelter for both of you. Planks are strong, heavy, and well protected from rain and wind. When you knock, they seem to be thick. While the door shakes at your push, it won't open. Defensive structures usually have a locking bar on the inner side, but you also see a large keyhole. You walk around the tower, making sure there are no windows or other entrances. It doesn't look like you can get in without destroying the door, and doing so is going to make a potential entryway for wild creatures. Hmm. Well, we don't really need uh, anywhere right now to... Um to chill um, because uh, we've got a long time. So look through the keyhole. You kneel down and take a peek. There's nothing in the hole, but the room is dark with tiny bits of light passing through the crevices of the windows. You see shapes of wooden furniture like tables, casks, and a ladder, but the only movement you notice is belongs to the dust in the sunbeams. I return to the crossroads. Yeah, I don't think we should waste time here because I don't want to destroy whatever this structure is. Um, Unless we need to. Oh, wow. We can go in lots of directions. That is very interesting. Um, okay, well, let's keep going this way for now. The first part of the trail is narrow and overgrown. The steep crag in the south divides the lush forest in half. You barely recognize any shapes in the entanglement of greys, browns, and greens. The northern landscape, while similarly impenetrable, is the exact opposite. The meadow turns into barren hills and mountains, covered by grass and bushes. Maybe the riding ibexes of the clans people from the growing mountains would get through such a barrier. There are no clans here. What does that mean? Ooh. The road leads you downhill to the edge of a lake. The clearing around the dwelling is quiet, with no cricket, crickets, flies, or even toads. The grass is not even knee high. There are no sign of a wharf or boats. The wall wasn't coated and has already been bitten by winds and rain. I look for an entrance. Right next to the gate, a gargoyle or stone lookalike kneels on a slab. It's dark purple, almost black, with yellow pointy teeth. Though its half open mouth has no tongue and the creature doesn't move an inch. The eyes have been replaced by crystals, red like currant juice. Wow, pretty creepy. What the hell is this place? I touch the gargoyle. Your hand seems tiny when placed on the monster's shoulder which is coarse and cold like a rock. You consider pushing one of the teeth, but the eyes of the gargoyle suddenly grow brighter. Wow, this is cool. What do you want? I'm not expecting anyone, 
the words are coming from the monster's mouth that remain still. Stand in front of me. I want to see a mug. The drawling voice belongs to a woman, but is lined with an unusual creaking. Uh, <laughs> that seems a bit too friendly. Hmm. Flattery. I must say, as a road warden, I've seen some disgusting beasts, but surely you have the kindest voice of them all. During the long pause, the glow of the gargoyle's eyes subside. Once they light up again, the voice gets even colder. I don't know what answer you're looking for, but you get none. Do you even know who I am? I don't, I'm afraid. I'm just getting to know the realm. Oh, so you lost your way, and now you're wasting my time. I'm Eudocia, the only enchantress you find in this land, and you're disturbing my work. I don't see people in the middle of the day. Turn in the early morning, or a few hours before dusk, if you have to. Best yet, don't bother me at all. The monster's eyes darken again. Your mount is ready to ride away. I'll wait for as long as it takes for her to let me in. It'll make her angry, but I touch the gargoyle again. Hmm. How long do we wait? A long time. It's getting colder, but finally the monster's eyes grow red. Go inside. I'll be with you soon. The monster's eyes darken again. Soon after, you hear heavy footsteps and the earth shakes. Something lifts the beam blocking the gate. You realize your hand is already on the haft of your axe. I try to relax. I'm safe. One day such instincts are going to save my life. The gate opens violently and rebounds with a loud thud, almost closing again. The creature in front of you is made of floating rocks that appear to be connected, but it's just an illusion. They could twist and bend in every direction. The eyeless sentinel faces you blankly. You've seen other golems in Hovlevan, endlessly helping with bothersome tasks, but you've no idea what makes them move. It lowers its slab-like hands and steps aside, making way for you. Its head rotates following your steps, but other than that, it's as motionless as a statue. I enter the yard. The house in front of you has a huge entrance, just large enough for a golem. The building is whitewashed, but the lime is aged and damaged. The tools are spread around in no particular order. The rocks resting on the top of the shed resemble the golems. A few birds stare at you from the roofs, while many more ignore you. None seem willing to approach the garden patches, despite the growing, though neglected, vegetables. It's quiet here. I approach the sitting golem. It seems dead, inactive, as city folk would call it, but the pneuma still makes its chunks float less than an inch from one another. It doesn't react to your presence. But like the previous golems, this one bears engraved signs on larger rocks. Their meaning is unclear to you, and you can't tell if they're decoration or carriers of a spell. A leaf of the doors open. Knowledge. I know these letters. The signs represent regular words used in Wright's tablets. Their shapes are very old angular and not adjusted to the softness of a quill. The words read as follows. Hunt, prey, chase, meet, beast, run, bring, wait, and disguise. The golem's owner is waiting behind you. The woman is tall and stands upright, with her arms crossed and legs apart. She's more than 30, with a face touched by lack of sleep. She gives you a long look, observing your blade, hands, boots, and forehead. Everything but your eyes. I greet you. Without the distortion caused by the gargoyle, her voice, her strong voice isn't as disquieting. No surprise I caught your eye. But don't disturb it. It's very much awoken and will defend itself. Or me, if it comes to it. I give her a better look. She's wearing a long, ragged robe covered in stains. It used to be blue, but now it's unevenly pale. She's barefoot with skin covered with dust and dirt. Her dark hair was recently washed, but it's entirely spread on her shoulders, back and chest. She wears no jewelry, belt, or buckles. I'm glad you have a moment to spare. I won't bother you for long. Thank you for agreeing to see me. She absolutely stares at you. If you're looking for help, you came to the wrong place. I don't make sacrifices for others. If you need to bother me, speak in the tongue of dragons and barter. It's not a sanctuary, often your bed or stew. She walks past you and cocks her head towards the golem, who let you in. It turns around and shuts the gate. Good that you came at such an hour. Keep it up in the future. 
If you ever come here in the middle of the day, you'll stand outside looking at the doors like an ibex. We don't need more salutations. So, why are you here? Okay, so we've got a series of options here with what we want to do. Um, what do we want to do, though? That's the question. Let's just go through an order. I'm trying to learn about the peninsula. She leans away, frowning. I can't even begin to describe how much I hope you weren't here to exchange gossip. If you crave it so much, ride south to Pelt of the North. The keeper is stiff like a broom, but offers a nice room. She glances at you, but her grey irises remain absent. Or if you'd rather visit a cheerful place, ride north to Foggy Lake. Was it Foggy Lake? Whatever. Foggy is the keeper. At least she's not boring as the other guy. Um. Okay, now we've got a million things to talk about. Um... Okay, let's just go with the arrow. Why aren't you tracing a murderer? She smirks, but then grabs the arrow and takes a look. Black and orange. I don't know much about wood, but I recognize these feathers. The people of Gale Rocks breed such pheasants. It's in the far north, close to the coast. How interesting. Hmm. You have been to the shortcut? Only once, and it's not a good memory. A brief tale is rather vague. She once had to use her golems to travel to the other side, seeking a remedy for her stomachache. The beasts weren't afraid of the, the beasts weren't afraid of the noise they make, but the monkeys in the far west are too dumb even for that. They kept throwing things at us, even poop. He pauses, making a disgusted grimace. We couldn't reach them or scare them away. You ask what happened next, but she crosses her arms. Eh, I was told it's better to ignore them, let them get used to one sight. But my stomach was better already, so we just took the long way back. Um, I've heard about bandits, don't they bother you? She puts her hands on the sides and straightens up, display displaying her unusual height. Is this another sick game of hers? If so, tell her I'm not interested either in her head or her office. You notice the sudden movement of her golem. So what's your story? Why do you live so far from any village? No. Fine. <laughs> I have some questions about your golems. He wanders around the closest sentinel and observes it like, like a farmer with a donkey before a purchase. Isn't it clear what they are? Furniture that walks and works. They carry rocks and logs, hunt kind of, and protect this place while I rest. What else is there to say? Do they talk? Eudosia still moves her lips, but her words are coming from the stone creature, which doesn't move an inch. No more than, than the gargoyle you've seen. The voice is deep, distorted by an echo. They don't need meat or bones, and listen to my commands, but have no understanding of what's happening around them. To create a sentient creature, you need a human shell, and a whole lot of necromancy. The golem raises its hand and shows you its palms, and I'm going, not going to touch that. She then mentions that her creatures, uh, her creation isn't much of a messenger, and needs to remain close to her. Just look at it. The golem covers its non-existent mouth. It has no eyes, snout, or ears. Seeing the world through its head is like putting your eyeball in a rosebush. It takes Numa, and the further away it is, the more exhausting it gets. How do you make one? I fill each rock with Numa and then bind them together. You won't build one anyway. Like alchemists, enchanters have their own secrets, and I've got no way of sharing my talent with others. Is it for sale? One day, or uh, so I hope, one wrong order, it will tear your head away or kick over a house. It won't ever be safe, but the dead make for bad customers, and I won't be blamed for other stupidity. A further answer comes in great detail. But they're rather complex. From what you understand, she plans to invent a set of very specific commands that could be quickly learned, and then bind them to a wand, bringing it to the creature. I'm still not sure if it's the safest solution. If a wand was taken by a reaver, stuff could get ugly. It's so loud when it walks, don't monsters react to its presence? She lets out a chuckle. They flee from them as they would from trolls. They can't stalk their prey or jump them from a bush. 
when they don't move for long, beasts take them for rocks. It's not like they need to breathe, it just sits still waiting for a roe deer to get close. The golem's eye suddenly gets brighter, it jumps forward and punches the air, it lands with a sound of thunder. That's why I need them to be so large, I can't give them muscles, the speed I give them is pure pneuma, being firm and heavy helps. She disregards your mention of the wrath of the herds. True. True, I make more mess than most humans would, but that's one of the reasons why I stay away from the villagers. Being all alone, I give the beasts time to get used to my walls, and my sentinels know to stay away from unicorns and peddlers. Let's change topic. What's with the gargoyle? Can't an enchantress show off her trophy? She gives you a proud smile. My sentinels took it down years ago. The tribe of old Pagos is fond of their statues, so I have my own. Back in the old days, long before monks came to the north. Seeing your puzzled look, she twirls her hair. A dead gargoyle on the road, or by a village gate, was meant to scare off evil spirits. I don't know about that, but its sight sure taught the local beasts who they're dealing with. What can you tell me about enchanting? She looks at your hands and starts to twirl her hair. Not really. I don't know how I do the stuff I do. As a kid, I put Numa into toys. I made my sparrow fly, and my whistle gave a tune without being blown. I practiced for years, but by doing, not by understanding. She puts her hand on her hip and observes her clean nails. I can't teach stuff that's in my fingers or my eyes or my breath. It's just part of me. I'm looking for Asterion, the previous road warden. She raises her chin, challenging your look. I know not where he may be, but if he wanted to be found, he'd let us find him. What else? That is an interesting uh, response, and it does make sense. He's obviously in the heart of the forest, isn't he? Probably right. Um, I'm looking for a job. She stands still for a moment, then cocks her head to the side. Got some stuff um, that could use another hand. You up for some danger if it comes to it? You nod and ask what sort of creature is bothering her. No, I meant riding and climbing. If you can do it without grabbing the axe of yours, fine. Now give me a moment. She opens one of the heavy doors to her house and you catch a glimpse of a messy bed and a floor covered with clothes. After a minute, she shows up with a large sack filled with rods made of smooth, clean bronze. Here's the gist of it. I need you to get to eight spots across the peninsula. High buildings, trees, mountainsides. I don't really travel much, so I can't hold your hand. I need one of them in white marshes in the wetlands far west of here. Other than that, you need to keep your eyes open. Once you reach a good spot, place one of these as high as you can get. I'll pay you in dragons, two for each one. But place at least four before you come to see me. I need as many of them out there as possible. Oh, this is cool. So far, so good. What are they for? Well, there's magic in them, as you can imagine. You weigh a rod in your hand. Even though it's more than two feet long, it's light and empty inside. You could bend it on your knee. The bag also contains a long hemp cord and a, a scrap of cloth. If I were to send my golems away, let's say a mile or two, they'd stop moving, waiting for me to show up. Excuse me? She approaches the nearest sentinel and touches its chest. They carry similar rods inside, so the plan is to give my orders better range, so to speak. I'm tired of depending on hirelings, especially since they no longer stop by. She leans against the golem. Questions? How much time do I have? Oh, don't worry about it. Let's say before the leaves turn yellow. Some of the locals may not be happy with me putting bronze rods on their rooftops. Wardens do have ways to get on people's good side, correct? And I can be sure you've no plans to raid the villages with an army of unstoppable sentinels, right? Her grey eyes give you a cold, disquieting look. You could swear it's getting colder in here. I won't ask for your trust, and I don't need it. Either help me, or leave the rods and do your own stuff. I may be forced to pull some strings to get it done. Two dragon bones won't be enough. You haggle for a bit, but her distrust is like a wall. She waves your arguments off. I'm not a merchant. I don't gather coins for the thrill of it. I'm putting almost 20 dragons on the table here. It should be enough. Do all eight rods and I may prepare ought else for you. We have a deal. Cool. Okay, so at least we've got something to do. Um, if we do get stuck, 
and like we can't explore anymore or something. Um, could you fill an item of mine with Numa? That's not how this works. She points at her golems. Her nails are short and clean and her hands are soft. I work all the time, but each item takes me days, sometimes a full season. The tribes bring me things to enchant in the early spring, collect them a year later. I've got to... She blinks a few times, not sure what to say. Her grey eyes widen. Imagine stuff. It takes great focus. She's such a fucking cool character. Like, I'm, I'm loving this uh, plot line. Uh, you mentioned that you generously reward her, but she only shrugs. You don't plant, you don't build. I won't eat dragon bones. For now, do your warden duties and come to me by the end of autumn. Maybe I'll have time to get something done for you after the thaws. What if I'm in desperate need? She rolls her eyes. Ye and everyone else. I need a place to rest. Can I spend the night here? Even though she draws out her words with frustration, she speaks with ease, as if she's reciting a memorized speech. I know how harsh the woods can be, but I don't offer shelter to travelers. I don't want to look behind my own shoulder for hours or use my golems to protect ye. Travel north or south, look for a tavern or inn. You'll find a safe heart there. She blinks and crosses her arms. And we're both adults. Don't tell me I could bind ye with a rope or take away your blades. The less I have to touch ye, the better. Do you have any, anything interesting to sell? Well, I'm not a trader. I do the stuff people ask me about, and they're not for sale. There's but one tool I'm willing to part for, for ten bones. But it's for spellcasters only. She reaches out to you. On her one open palm, you see a flat, small pebble, bluish, but in no way unusual. You put it in your mouth and press it to your palate. No chewing. If you're a sorcerer, it will store your Numa. What if it's used by someone who has stills Numa in them, or can't use magic? Oh, you don't want to do that. It will boil your blood and rip your skin apart. Each shell is like a bottle for Numa. It has limits. You can train to contain more of it, like I've been doing for more than 20 years. But there's no magical rock that's going to do it for you. Why a pebble? Wouldn't a potion be easier? I smell of smoke and mushrooms? I'm not going to play around with flasks and alembics. This one won't break, won't scatter, won't spoil. Perfect for travellers, or any buyer, really. She steps away and adjusts her dirty robe. It works, and it won't hurt you if you're smart with it. It's a lifesaver. I'll think about it. Um, I found a barren field that may be affected by a curse. Do you have anything I could use to see if I'm right? A cursed field? Where do you find this stuff? As he explained briefly, she observes your boots. I know the place, but... She observes, steps away, and approaches the garden patch by her house. She observes it for a moment, then kneels down, paying no attention to her robe, and reaches for a wooden spade. What she digs out looks like a tree sapling with two leaves that are as large as a hand, and thin elastic stalk. It's shorter than your head. Would you look at that? Still green. Give me two dragons and I'll put it in a bag with soil. It should survive at least a couple of days. Well, you plant it, of course. Wait for half an hour and you'll see. If it grows an inch... Forget it. If it bursts into bloom, the soil is enchanted. If it withers, it's cursed. It stays the same. No Numa. Just be careful when you do it. It loves fogs. There's a plant that grows by magic. Yes, and it costs two dragons. I, I don't know what, what this is, but like... <laughs> Why do you have this? What? No! These plants are the only stuff I can think of right now. I'm trying to make a plant that grows without sunlight using just water, soil, and numa. I'll know I'm there once it starts to bear fruit. I swear, don't even mention mushrooms. It's just a hobby of mine. I'll think about it. Let's trade. Uh, I don't really have the money for this, to be honest. Okay, um, I need to have a think about um, what to do is what needs to happen right now. I will seem to order some food for myself. As I cannot. I have to eat early today, so I need to order something before the stream ends. Kind of annoying, and I appreciate that, but there's not much we can really do. Just one of those things. Where are we going to go? That's the question. So, we can't stay here. But we only have three hours before dusk. We could just go back to the tower and stay there. 
Hmm. This is slightly unfortunate because we we are we might get stranded. Um basically right now because we do not have anywhere to stay. Um we could go back to the Pelt of the North. Or Tulia's camp. Um, and that would allow us to rest somewhere. So it's three hours before dusk. Or we could push further. In. But it's going to be a bit late. Also, this fallen tree thing is was obviously annoying when we went past, past there. Um... Which is unfortunate. So that might be pretty annoying. Um, but. Not sure. I feel like it's kind of. Pushing us to. Do this. Okay. Right. Anyway. I need to order a pizza. Um, and then I will probably take us back to the Pelt. Although we're running out of money, so maybe we'll go to Tulia's camp. We haven't checked in on them in a while as well, so it might be a good idea. Pizza, do we want? That's the question. Yeah, I need to order it right now, basically. Um, Parmigiana, that's like aubergine, right? Sorry, this is a really annoying thing to have to do on stream, but like, I don't, yeah, this is an, an odd circumstance today, um, because I didn't have much time. It was either like, do this, or like, not stream at all, um, not much we could really do about it. Okay, yeah, I think I might get Parmigiana, I'm not really feeling meaty today. It's a shame though, because that one does look lovely. Broccoli. Yeah, let's get Parmesan. So, what's it got on it? Um, we could add some extra chili, but I could. I've got chili flakes. I don't really need to do that. Do we want a side dish of anything? Some olives. Cool. Yeah, so I reckon that's probably going to come about the, the right time for me to just have a snack before somebody arrives. Okay. Cool. Okay. So sorry about that. Right. Any... But he got any particular persuasion? 
I think we should go back to Tulia's camp and then push back over this way. I know it seems like a waste of time, but... Also, this is another thing. So if we technically smash in the watchtower, um, we could place one of the rods on the top of it, um, which would be a pretty cool thing to do. Um, it's definitely a tall structure. But... Is that going to be an issue? I wonder. Okay. Um... Oh, I just don't know, though. I feel like we, we should go back. I'm probably going to regret this. Okay, let's save it, and then we can decide what we want to do. Um, oh, it just does a quick save, apparently. Okay, and then let's go... Um, let's go and explore. This is probably so dumb, but whatever. With no trees blocking your view, you look at the bright and colourful stars. The simple bridge is centuries old, bitten by time. It makes you think of the dolmen you saw south of here. The torrent here is deep and fast, with plenty of fish. The boat is destroyed beyond repair, rotting and falling to pieces, with holes in the floor and on the sides, overgrown with moss and fungi. The thick shrubs lining the path are covered with thorns. Small birds are jumping from one twig to another, pecking at the brown berries. Knowing from the herbaria that the fruits are safe, you eat a few bittersweet ones as well. Knowledge. I think I've read something about these fish. You see dozens of red and grey shells. As you walk by, they stay close, following your step. According to the testimonies from a murder trial you've read about, they have long, sharp teeth, eat flesh, and could scrap your skull clean in a minute or so are the piranhas. I look around for an hour or so, maybe I can find something to use. After what feels like an eternity of searching around the boat, you, the banks and shrubs, you sit down on the bridge to take a break, then realise you haven't actually looked beneath it. You kneel on the grass and look into the darkness. On the... Uh, among the cobwebs and bugs, you spot an old piece of fabric pinned under a rock. You pull it out and find a rotting torn pouch that contains a single dragon bone. You make sure you haven't missed the other ones in the dirt, if they ever existed. They've rolled down and sunk for good. You throw the pouch away and stand up. Wow, that's awesome. Sadal looks around nervously and approaches you when it notices your attention. The point's staying here, we move forward. Can't stay here. Okay, so how long have we got now? We've got 45 minutes. Yeah, we messed up. We messed up big time. Let's keep going then. Madness. We're absolutely insane. We're gonna die then and we'll probably have to load, but whatever. The gentle road leads downhill, getting greener and less rocky farther north you get. Just in case, your eyes run towards a drier part of the meadow and you instantly shout at Sadal to make haste. A pack of short-haired wolves, at least 20 members strong, is chasing after you. Their coats are a mixture of yellow, black and white spots, as if someone threw mud and painted them. They move towards you with a human-like speed, and you realise only some of them are running straight at you. They're trying to cut through my path. If it wasn't for your palfrey, the beasts would have already caught up with you. Their trap was perfectly set up, not leaving you any path of escape. Your terrified mount is disciplined enough to stay on the beaten path, and even though one of the big-eared wolves almost sinks its teeth into your mount's thigh, you manage to squeeze beneath the hunters. In the next few minutes, you do your best to get further away, while your gallop is indeed faster, the wolves easily shorten the distance by moving through the sparse forest. You ride past a wooden cabin placed in the clearing at the bottom of a rock face, but you can't stop while the path is at your back. 
Maybe I have something I can use here. Got nothing to fight them off with. Focus on the road ahead. Forcing your mount to speed up whenever a beast tries to catch it. After another few minutes, you leave the hills and enter the grasslands of a valley, but the pack doesn't give up on you yet. At least their numbers have stopped growing, but you're already outside their territory, and a handful of spotted colourful shells also seem tired, and they're forced to stay on the beaten path. You get out of the valley, um, and follow another narrow path through the hills and trees, clearly shaped by humans, at least in part. The leaves and rocks start to blur into a vague memory, but after another few minutes, the howls stop. You don't slow down just yet. You reach a gentle open path, seek it, seeing a lake to the west and hearing a gentle creak ahead of you. Sidal is exhausted but patient, more happy to survive than it is angry at your wanderlust. At least you can hope the pack will move to a different place during the night. Better get out of the saddle and rest for a bit. The air is humid but fresh and vitalizing. The light touches the road and shrubs, blocked only by the single willow, wild and untrimmed. You're by a lake, too large for you to see it to the bank, but the local soil isn't too fertile. There are only a few trees on the horizon, while the struggling bushes and grasses fight with layers of rocks. The path leading farther north is green, bright and calming. The grey rabbit is cleaning its fur near the brook, but the sound of hooves makes it hop towards the nearest shrub. Right after it sinks into the leaves, you hear its squeal cut off quickly. Whatever the hunter was, it leaves behind only the rustling of the thicket and a trail of blood. You wait for a long minute with a hand on your axe, but the creature doesn't return. You relax a bit, then turn towards the stone statue of a woman. Such a monument will be better fit for a temple or a rich city folk's house. Here, without any cover, it's already losing its shape from the rains and dust. Chunks of the face and hair have already broken off. It has detailed eyes and human-like proportions and the clothes are like fabric petrified by a spell. The statue carries the unusual travelling equipment, a walking staff, a gamberson, simple pants, now covered by leaves. It's a shame to see it deteriorating. I look at the pedestal, maybe someone left a valuable offering here. You dismount and approach the bushes, covering the legs and pedestal. You see some old wooden bowls as well as rocks. You try to push the leaves away, but their stems are thick and healthy, crowded with insects and spider webs. Until you remove the thicket, you won't be able to see if any, anything's worth stealing. Thankfully, there are no thorns, and the touch of a leaf doesn't make your finger itchy. But well, you've been playing it as well, Bad Wolf. Cool. How have you been finding it? Like, I'm I really interested, actually, to see um, how different it is every playthrough. Like, how much of it is procedural and how much of it is story. Like, I don't know. I was surprised after watching your first video... Oh, I see. You made similar choices. Yeah, it does seem like, at least earlier on, there's um quite a few kind of obvious choices, I suppose. Um, I really need to get these uploaded to YouTube, actually, because it's a pretty good series, because I'm not, like, taking breaks or being interrupted or anything like that. Um, so I'll have to do that. Maybe I'll do that later, actually. I should write a note to remind myself that that's something I should do. Yeah, I think that would definitely be a good idea. Um, okay, so I do feel like this probably isn't a holy statue, so we probably can steal. Um, I don't really feel like that would be a bad thing to do necessarily. Um, I don't think I got anything from it anyway. Um, I consider washing myself. I don't have any soap. If about In about half an hour, I could use my axe to cut down the bushes and twigs. Hmm. You tether the sedal to the tree, letting it choose between drinking, grazing, and napping. You prepare your equipment, keeping an eye on the bush where you saw the rabbit's last moments. You use your weight to move the plants to one side, and then cut right above the ground. The stems are healthy and flexible, so getting them through is rough but you have enough strength to deal with them in a couple of minutes, and you throw them in the lake. The work goes on for a bit, but once you're done, the statue stands in its former glory. A couple of old offerings are still on the pedestal. Polished rocks, bone figurines, and mouldy bowls and plates are used to store food. In one vessel, you see a dragon bone. It's dark and could be older than a generation, but it would surely be accepted by a merchant. I think I'm probably going to take it. I'm, I'm pretty poor right now. <laughs> I pick it up and put it in my pouch. You wash it in the brook, and straighten up a tiny bit richer. 
the statue is silent. Ooh, this would have been a good place for a uh, fish trap. This probably would have been better. It's too dangerous to stay here again. Oh, God. Yeah, we've really messed up. Haven't we? Because we can't even travel anywhere. Yeah, this is going to be bad, is all I'll say. We managed to get there in the night. That was mental. I'm curious if the fish trap will help feed me. Yeah, I, I put it in the, um, in the like, ruined shelter place. Um, but whether that's actually going to be um, of any use, I, I don't really know. Um, then again, I don't seem to be, like, using a lot of rations. Um, I think as I've been kind of paying to stay in a few places lately. Um, so that's kind of helped me out, I suppose. Whether that's, I don't know, the right decision or not, I'm not sure. Tulia welcomes you with a smile. Is everything all right? You hear the soldiers' loud discussion as they carry buckets of water. I have more questions. Did you ever enter the road leading through the heart of the forest? We were advised not to. Have you seen this huge gate in the west, made of rocks, very tall? We met a guard there named Quinton, maybe. A kind soul. He almost begged us not to enter the woods, so we took the longer route. That's where all the settlements are, anyway. We didn't miss much. Do you have any idea what happened to the ruined village in the west? Nah. But there are goblins all around the walls, so we never went there. But I was told that the Wrath of the Herds crushed it, maybe ten years ago. If there were any survivors, they're surely gone by now. Maybe they moved to other settlements or left the peninsula. Or they got caught by bandits. You ever encountered the bandits from the north? There are the bandits in the woods after all. A companion hits his forehead with her palm. This peninsula really hates us. We can't make a dent in its shell. Julia puts her hand on his shoulder then looks back at you. Thanks for telling us, Road Warden. If I survive long enough to report to someone, I'll sure be, be sure to mention it. Maybe I should learn more about them first. Sure, good luck with that. You, you're ready to prepare your sleeping spot. I approach the barrel with water. Mm, yeah, I need more soap. Okay, sleep time. Okay, this is not going to be good for us because it's obviously... We're just sleeping on the ground, but not much we can really do. You're on the verge of death. <laughs> the sound of rain wake wake see what briefly before you return to sleep you think about your plans riding the mud is difficult Stel will have a rough time especially on unpaved grounds maybe a good day to take a break at an inn yeah i'd say so like most people you wake in the middle of the night almost every night before your second sleep comes in you spend an hour or two taking care of your belongings shell and soul some people spend this time with friends families or lovers but your routine is different you don't have to take care of essential tasks. Do you have anything besides soap to help you wash? I've never found anything um, other than soap, but there are different types of soap. I, I, there is, I, you definitely can get um, something somewhere. Um, I just seem to remember um, speaking to somebody um, who had some stuff to sell, um, but I can't, I can't remember who that was, unfortunately. I'm pretty sure there was somebody, though. Okay, so let's have a little gander. Spend some time outside. Let's check on my horse. Your back begs you to stand up. A green field mouse is foraging from the grass and away you've noticed it. You prepare Sadal for the journey ahead. Okay. So, what we are going to do is we're going to go to the Pelt and we're going to spend some time there because we have... Yeah, because we're, we're just a complete mess, so we're just going to go to the Pelt and I think we're going to spend a day there. Um, how's the scavenger doing? Let's have a talk to the scavenger and then we'll we'll chill here for a day or something like that. Enjoying your stay. It's not bad here, not bad at all. They bought me what I could sell, but the hunters want my entire pouch for getting me so th 
We've agreed to a lower price, and they just won't drop whatever it is they're doing to escort me. I don't care. I'll wait for a couple of days, do some chores for the innkeep, rest up from the forests. Once the hunters are done with their plans, we'll move out. He scratches his cheek and beard and finally sighs. But do feel like I've eaten troll shit. When I landed here, I had a pile of bundles and trinkets, and no, I'm starting with nothing again. Should have listened to the warnings. This land belongs to no man. I came for my reward. And you shall have it. You saved my life, or what's left of it. And if I could give you more, I would. But I'll need to pay the innkeep for barns on my damn arm, you see. So here's as much as we said. Five dragons. I nod and put the dragons in my pouch. I have some other questions. Aye, right, we can talk. Go ahead. Tell me about yourself. I could tell you stories for days, but who cares? I'm just doing things my way. Moving from wall to wall, sleeping where they let me, buying what I need, selling what I can, saving dragons for later use. I used to be a sailor. People called me Pyros because of, you know, the forehead. But I'm not, not one to push a plough or patch ship sails all day long. I don't care if a corpser eats my bones one day, as long as I can stay free for a couple of years more. And I'm damn good at staying safe, or rather, I was, before I landed in this shithole. He touches his scarred face and smirks unpleasantly. Haven't gotten one of these in years, but it didn't take two weeks on the road here, and I almost lost my legs. Spent all my coin in Howler's Dell for Elder's magic. Not the first time I've had an empty pouch, not gonna lie, but there's no coin waiting here. Once I push all the iron to the locals, I'm moving south. But I won't ride alone. I'm not making that mistake again. I've heard no ships can land on this coast. Wait, well... You're patient and take your time. You can get to Gale Rocks from the sea. Sure, no hope for a ship or any trade, but with some help you can do it. Uh, don't tell anyone I told you this. It's not something people should tell about. I Take another look at the main hall. Ooh, he's called Pyros. We know his name now. That's fucking cool. Finally. That's pretty damn awesome, not gonna lie. Okay, I go to the innkeeper. Um, we need food. Oh man, he keeps telling me this. Oh. Um. So we. Yeah. So we could rest here. Yeah, but it's not going to give us food. So basically, we need to use up some rations. With the problem is, we got in that sticky situation because um, we couldn't eat because we were being chased by wolves. Um, so what we should probably do is buy some rations off him to kind of keep us going. Um, leave that. Um, I'd like to ask about someone. What was the Enchantress called? Edosia or something like that. Ed Edosia. What does it say in the journal? Humans. Um, Eudocia. Let's ask him about Eudocia and see what he says. Oh. Oh, Eudocia's crazy! She lives in a lonely house all by herself, skinny and dirty like a corpse eater, surrounded by golems. Never smiles, never cries, one of those. She never leaves her home, and if you see it from far away, it looks abandoned. A few times a year, people travel to her and make trade and trade barrels of food for magical items. Let me know if you have any tips to make money. Yeah, I'm struggling with that, I'm not gonna lie. Search everything, you might find scraps of money on the floor. Um, also, go to the camp and escort Pyros, and he'll give you five money. Um, also, Eudocia has this, um, has this, so basically, go to the ruins, get the guy, and escort him wherever you want to go. You can also find some money on the old bridge, and at the statue of the woman, and Eudocia, over here, has some quests you can do, but I haven't actually done them yet, but she gives you two uh, bones per Thing. I don't want to spoil what the actual thing is. Um, 
Let's change the topic. I haven't met a spider yet. Where is that? A spider? How intriguing. Right, so we... Um, I'll let you guys know. I could probably do about 10 more minutes, maybe 15, depending on how we go. I'm having a really good time though today, actually, with this game. Um, okay, let's go to the armorer. We don't need repairs. Ooh, yeah, let's do this. I'd like to put this world on your watchtower for Eudocia, the Enchantress. She moves it close to her face, observing it with widened eyes. Is this some sort of magic thing? I mean, if it's not dangerous, fine, I'll tie it somewhere during my watch, don't you worry. Oh, brilliant. I show her the arrow I found near the fallen tree. Did any of you drop this? Ah, we get ours from the villages in the south. And they don't use pheasant feathers. The locals ask too much for their arrows, as if they're filled with Numa or something. Oh no, I, I didn't, um, I haven't met the spider yet. I'm going to go back in that direction later on, I think, so. Okay, if I, if you have some coin, we can throw some dice. Time goes by, filled with light-hearted jokes and chit-chat. During the final round, you get ahead of everyone, and the spectators playfully comment on your moves. The winner takes all. Three dragons are placed on the table, and you put them in your pouch, quickly. Wow, nice. Oh my god, we're like kind of rich. 11! 11 bones! Oh my god. Cracking. Can't actually believe that. That's that's insane. Actually insane. Okay, um we could actually technically like pay them now. Yeah, we could actually pay them to do the goblins. But why would we do this? I feel like we shouldn't do this now, but this is something we definitely need to look at doing. Um, let's have a little look. Quests. I need to find a shield. Ooh, that would be useful. Yeah, my character's a scholar. I don't know what, what you picked. Um, hmm. <sighs> okay. We, why can we not rest? Okay, we're going to rest here for a day. Um, because that's what I want to do. God, we look terrible, though. It's not really helped our vitality. I've been relaxing. It's been a relaxing day, but free of boredom. You spent almost an hour looking after your mount, but at least it's now clean and cheerful. You patch holes in your bundles to the soothing sounds of late summer drizzle. Some of the hunters occupied the watchtower, while the rest of the group went after some big game beyond the walls. The windows are open, and while there's a few guards eating and drinking, the hall is clean. The innkeeper is sitting behind the counter, contemplating an empty mug. Pyrrhus is sitting in a corner, napping, though he winks at you when you look towards him. The problem is, we kind of need to rest again. Um, go to the well and wash, but it's not going to do much good. Okay, let's sleep um, and rent a room, and that will make us a little bit more, hopefully, less dead. It's a calm, warm night. As your first sleep ends, you stretch out and prepare yourself for an active hour or two. It's time to take care of some things that must be done at least once every few days though they're a bit more challenging than your nightly routine. It's time to check on my herbs and the ingredients. I get rid of the plants that failed to dry out, throw them away, nothing that's rotten, and wash my jars before I fill them up again. Cool. I love this little thing in the night that you do. The small room is quiet and far away from unwanted eyes. Hmm. Okay, Brill. Well, let's head on out. Um, <laughs> we're not in a particularly good way. Um, so we probably should rest, but I feel like wasting another day is going to be a bad idea. Yeah. Can we actually... We can travel. Okay. Save. Travel. Right. I think we go here, um, is what my, my gut is telling me. Because um, I feel like going up that way again is going to be risky. 
Oh, the cabin. The cabin is the, um... It's the spider. Yeah, let's go here and see what, see what happens. The path leads downwards through the hills. The forest gets thicker and the signs of human touch are rare. The lone large boulder draws attention. You can't guess its age, but the path around it suggests it was passed plenty of times already. You stop sit down and take a closer look. The remains of red paint are covering the eastern side. It's the same message as the one you saw at the southern crossing. Don't enter. Danger ahead. You look down the dark road and hear a distant roar. Oh, oh, oh. oh boys. Okay. No way are we doing this. I'm not ready to enter the, the forest. You look at your bundles, mountain weapons, and think about the beasts of the woods. You may not be able to outrun them. I've searched for the tracks I found at the watchtower. The hard keels can't be mistaken, and the travellers didn't mask their footsteps. They passed the rock from both sides, heading deeper into the forest. How interesting. The stream ahead can be crossed by a humble ford, made of hundreds of rocks that used to reach the bottom to the surface, but is now partially demolished, either by time or a living creature. For a rider, crossing it wouldn't be much of a problem, but most travellers would have to take off their pants and shoes, and moving an entire wagon would be quite a challenge. Yeah, so apparently it's an evolutionary thing um, that uh, your body actually sleeps for like four hours and then you you wake up, you kind of stir for a while, and then you go you you know you go back to sleep again. So it's actually supposed to be better for you, um, although obviously we... I don't even want to get into this huge discussion, but basically capitalism has forced us to be um, more uniform in the way that we approach, um, you know, the day, I suppose. So we, we don't have the choice to do that. Um, I suppose some people do. Um, I don't know enough about the science behind it, I suppose. I should spend some time gathering larger rocks and throwing them into the water. Why would I do that? Hmm. But now I ignore it. Where are we? I feel like we're we're doing something that we should be doing. Yeah, we probably should like go back. I, I don't think this is good. But whatever. The colours of leaves range from greens to purples and overwhelm you with shadows. The stems of the shrubs twist in all directions, seeking the slightest scraps of sunlight. The trees are not tall, but their trunks are as wide as buildings. The neglected road has been carved into a thicket, an inch at the time, a corridor of plants with a floor made of pebbles that give way to saplings and vines. From time to time you pass by many turns, relics left by the roaming dragons, unicorns and trolls, some of them are still used by beasts. The birds are sharing their song, as cheerful as ever. You reach a gap in the tunnel of plants. The meadow nourishes um, a lonely tree growing in the shadow of a rocky hill, surrounded by humble grasses. Near the tree roots, a wolf without fur is feasting on a human corpse, unaware of your presence. Hmm. I feel like we should mm, just go back somewhere, or... I don't know. I feel like it's pushing us to actually go into here, though. Um, to be honest. I look around. You see no other creatures. The road in front of you is passable. The birds in the sky seem harmless, and the beast raises a head. Its ears are shaking. I look at the wolf. It's standing on all fours, crouching forward with blood dripping from its massive canines. Its head, and especially jaws, are wide and long like those of a horse. Its brown shell is muscular, with pronounced shoulder blades, the hair resembling your arms, and a tuft of black fur at the end of its long tail. The beast turns its head towards you. Its eyes are like shining charcoal. Jesus Christ, is this really a wolf? I look at the corpse. You don't see much from afar. It's in one piece, with blood-sloped clothes torn to pieces, indistinguishable from loose flaps of skin. It has no, no sacks, bags, or equipment, but you spot a trail of blood leading into the trees. The creature must have dragged the shell from the deeper woods. The beast turns its head towards you. Its eyes are like shining charcoal. I look at the tree. The beast turns towards you, fixing its eyes in your palfrey. Its long mouth is covered in blood. After maybe two breaths, it moves, ready to strike. It's a bloody wolf, like... Can we fight a wolf? It's only one wolf. Wolves are quick, though. Also, it's very muscular. Fighting is not our forte. 
Let's ride away. I ride away as fast as we can. Sadal enters a trot with little encouragement as the beast charges at you, leaping forward quickly. You outrun the wolf just in time, escaping its giant jaws that force into the bushes. You do your best, maneuvering between the vines and branches. After a few minutes, you dare to look behind you, and you're alone. At least my companion is safe. Yeah, quick save is a good, good call. Your eyes wander between the walls of trees and shrubs. On one side, and a dirty pond on the other. The road itself is wide, covered with soggy logs that keep the ground from turning into mud. It's breaking under your mount's hooves, letting out what sounds like a sigh of relief. Yes. Okay, one second. Okay, so let's finish this and then I actually have to go. Um, the water is insufferably stinks of carrion and is covered with a blanket of green plants and wild flowers that draw countless buzzing insects. Even a horse shouldn't drink from it. We need to like stop going where we're going, but I don't really see how we can get out of this. We're kind of just like, yeah, stuck. <laughs> So Dal tries to get familiar with the unusual pavement and speeds up to jump over a fallen trunk, blocking your path. Once it lands, it breaks one of the logs in half. Soon after, you reach a massive black saurian resting in the ground, enjoying the light of the forest. It seems to be ignoring your presence. Once the monster raises its head, you're already in the air. The beast pushes itself away from the ground with its forelimbs, trying to catch any chunks of flesh with its massive jaws, but you safely hit the ground and return to a trot slowly. I pay attention to the dead trees sticking out of the pond. They look familiar. That's it. They look similar to that Saurian. Interesting. Okay, cool. Right, I'm going to wrap up here then, so I'm going to save for today. Um, we are apparently in the heart of the forest. Um, by accident. I, I didn't really want to do this, but in fairness, there's nowhere else we could have really gone at this point. We could, It was kind of pushing us to do this. And we did enter it. We haven't had any real problems so far um but it's not letting us travel which is weird so i don't know but anyway we're kind of hunting down these people as well that, that we're kind of looking at um brill well anyway i'm gonna wrap up for today it's been a cracking um little run um and thanks everybody for joining me especially bad wolf who um has been following along um yeah i don't know what's what's gonna happen um, with this, but it feels it feels like the, the story is really very cool, and um, they've definitely, um, you know, really created this world um, that has has been done very very well, and I'm really enjoying my exploration of it. So as I said before, hoping to get another stream in relatively soon, um, which will probably be War Tales, I would say, um, or something else. But I, th I think we kind of still have somewhere to go with War Tales, and I, I don't want to just abandon it uh, like I have with some of my other games. So maybe that'll be... We'll try and aim for Wednesday, but we'll see how things go. And but yeah, thanks so much. Um, and I'll see you all next time. <laughs>